there's a chemical in your body that may be responsible for the chronic fatigue and pain and cognitive issues that you may be dealing with, and you've probably never heard of this chemical before. I'm going to tell you what it is, uh, what it does, and show you some new research we just released about this chemical and tell you how this may lead to a future treatment. So the basic story is every day we are assaulted by pathogens. They can be viral pathogens, bacterial, they can be fungal, they can be things we're allergic to, uh, pollutants in the air. We're just bombarded by things that are attacking our system and our immune system has to fight these things off to keep us alive. So this happens on a daily basis and usually this occurs beneath our awareness because the immune system is so good at battling these things. And so typically we don't feel this occurring in, in a healthy, normal sense. Now, every once in a while, we may encounter a pathogen that just gets above that threshold where we feel something. We know something's wrong, but we don't know quite what it is. It may be just kind of woke up and felt a little weird and the whole day you're just kind of tired and irritable and you don't know what happened. Well, that could be a pathogen that you were exposed to and your immune system let it slip just a little bit and so your immune system had to crack down and have a more robust response, but, but still pretty small. So you just kind of feel a little off. Um, or it can be a little stronger than that and you may say, huh, I wonder if I'm gonna get sick and then you end up not getting sick. Uh, that was a little stronger reaction. Or it can be even stronger and you say, you wake up in the morning and go, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be sick, I know something's wrong. And then of course it can be stronger than that, all the way up to you can't get out of bed, you can't move. So what determines the degree to which you feel bit poorly are the microglia. So when your immune system is activated and when that pathogen is a potential serious issue, it'll send a signal to activate microglia in the brain to, to activate those microglia. And so the microglia, as you've probably heard before, they're typically in a resting state with these processes serving the environment. When they're activated, they'll pull those processes in and start to pump out pro-inflammatory cytokines. So how bad you feel is correlated with how many of the microglia are activated and to what degree they're activated. So it's kind of a, a continuum. So it can be from very little, you can barely feel it, to it's absolutely horrible. So that's the way it works. Now, as long as those microglia are activated, you're not going to feel well. But after the pathogen is dealt with, the microglia need to move back to their normal state so you don't feel sick anymore. To do that, they, there needs to be a signal. And that signal, or one of the signals, is fractalkine. And fractalkine is produced in a few different places in the body, but in the brain, which is what I'm interested in right now, it mostly comes from neurons. And so the fractalkine is a signal that's produced by the neurons that then go to the microglia and also astrocytes. So I'm dealing with the macroglia for now. They're sent from neurons to microglia and they calm the microglia down. They shift them, the microglia, into another state where they do not any longer cause inflammation. They actually tamp the inflammation down. So it's like the neurons are saying, microglia, thank you for all the inflammation. We really appreciate it. Problem's gone now, so just simmer it down. We'll let you know if we need you again. And that's how the process is supposed to work. So the question is, what would happen if that signal, that fractal kind signal, was not sent to the microglia, or if it wasn't received by the microglia? Well, what would happen is that the microglia would stay in their activated state. They wouldn't go back to the resting state. And so they would continue to make you feel ill day after day after day, even though there's no longer an invading pathogen. It'd be like um, a semi-truck rolling down a hill and the brakes give out. And so it's just barreling down and you lose control over it. So the fractal kind is the brakes that is supposed to calm down the inflammatory system after there's no longer an issue. So critically important to be healthy. And as you can probably guess, this is what I think is happening in fibromyalgia and myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome and uh, perhaps Gulf War illness and long COVID and related conditions. I think the microglia are not receiving the break signal, and so they are activated more than they should be, making you feel bad 
day after day after day, even though there's not an actual infection that needs to be eradicated at that point. So that's a hypothesis. Now, if that hypothesis is correct, that would lead us to developing certain treatments. So we need to prove whether that's the case. And so I did an experiment to find out whether or not individuals with fibromyalgia in this one experiment, who all, most of them also met chronic fatigue syndrome criteria, but it was about fibromyalgia. I wanted to know, are they mounting an insufficient fractal kind response once they've encountered a pathogen? So if you encounter a low level daily pathogen, are you going to get more sick than you should given the strength of that pathogen? Because your microglia are overexcited and they don't have those brakes applied. So that's what I did. And uh, that's not an easy thing to do in humans. The way I did that was by injecting lipipolysaccharide or endotoxin. Lipipolysaccharide is the kind of, it's like a little marker on the outside of E. coli bacteria and other bacteria. So it's not the bacteria itself. It's a little uh, amino acid and uh, lipid kind of little string of things on the outside that our body used to detect when we have a bacterial infection but it doesn't actually cause an infection. And I actually have um, a little vial, one vial here. This stuff is really tricky to work with, and it's because there's only one microgram of the lipipolysaccharide, the endotoxin in the bottom of this, and this is enough for about 30 people. And so when we dose someone, we have to get the dilutions uh, correct. We have to be very accurate in the dilutions so we don't overdose someone. That would make someone quite sick. Um, but the way we do this is we, we have them screened in the hospital. So they spend all day in the hospital. That way we can take their vitals and we can take blood and test all these different hypotheses. But what I did was I gave a very, very low dose of endotoxin. In fact, I picked dosages that were so low, I believe that the healthy controls wouldn't even feel it. I was trying to mimic the day-to-day -day super low level uh, exposures that we have. I was not trying to test what it's like when you get the flu or something serious. That would take a higher dose. So I used two dosages, a 0.1 nanograms per kilogram, and that one I didn't think anyone would feel. And then I did 0.4 nanograms per kilogram, which I did not think the healthy controls would feel. And I thought that the fibromyalgia might feel that level because their microglia are more sensitive. And the idea is we inject the lipipolysaccharide, and then we follow them throughout the day. We take blood, and I wanted to see, are they mounting an insufficient fractal kind response when they need to tamp down that inflammation? Because the inflammation should only last for about three hours because there's no actual pathogen. So it's very, very short, but it still requires a signal to be sent to the microglia to calm down when that thing is cleared. And I thought that that would be insufficient in the fibromyalgia patients. So you can actually read this paper, it is published. I paid to make this open access, so you should be able to access it. I'll put a link in the description below and you can read that for yourself. There are lots of things we tested in this experiment. I'm only talking about fractokine because it's too complicated to talk about the other pieces. I'll do that at another time, but just dealing with the fractokine for right now. And this paper was written by my graduate student, Chloe Jones, and Luke uh, Parkitney at Baylor uh, College of Medicine. So what do we find? I'm going to go, you know, to make these videos not too long, I'm just going to kind of go right to the main um, the main finding, and you can you can read and get all the kind of uh, other information. This was a small study. It was eight women with fibromyalgia and eight women who were healthy. They didn't have fibromyalgia or other chronic pain or fatigue. And what happened with the fibrokine is exactly what I suspected might happen. You can see that here we have the 0.1 nanogram on the left, the 0.4 nanogram on the right. And by the way, they came in for the 0.1 nanogram first, it was all day, and then they came back about three weeks a month later to do the 0.4, and they always got the 0.1 first and then the 0.4. But you can see the difference here. So the blue is the healthy, and around hour four after the LPS was administered, you start to see this ramp up of fractalkine that we're associating with putting the brakes on the microglia. So it's mounting this anti-inflammatory response to get things back to normal. You can see that the healthy individuals showed a nice little response to this super low uh, pathogen 
but the fibromyalgia patients did not mount a response. And so this looks to me as if there were no breaks put on the microglia, whereas with the healthy, there were. And so this agrees with my hypothesis that the microglia probably were overactivated in this state. We see the same thing at the point four nanograms. We see a nice big response from the healthies. The fibromyalgia in this case did have a fractal kind response, but it was still significantly less than the healthy controls. So what I think this means is when you run into these uh, pathogens, these exposures, viruses and bacteria every day, stuff in your food and stuff in the air, where normally this would be under the radar, it's making you re-sick almost every day. And that's why someone with chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia will feel bad every day. It'll fluctuate, and that may be dependent on what exposures they had maybe the day before that's activating their immune system. So this is really, uh, really interesting, and it's a potential model for what's going on with these diseases. If it's true, what do we do about it? So if the fractal kind is deficient, and by the way, in addition to this study, I've seen separately through my work that fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome patients have less fractokine just in their blood in general, and other studies have found that as well. So there's converging evidence that this is true. And by the way, I have to give the caveat that this was drawn out of blood, and I'm talking about the brain, and that's a problem. The reason why is because we don't have a way to measure fractokine in the brain yet. We'd have to make a PET radio ligand to do imaging. So we can't do that yet. And so I have to use blood as a proxy for what's going on in the brain. And that's not perfect, but it's what we have. It's still nice that it supports the hypothesis. But anyway, what do we do about it? The first obvious thing to test would be to give patients fractal kind in some form to see if they feel better. It's possible that by injecting fractokine, if it crosses the blood-brain barrier, they'll hit the microglia and calm them down, and that would have a robust long-term effect. I don't know if it would be a robust effect, but it's possible. It's also possible that we would inject the fractokine and they would feel better transiently, like for a few hours or a few days. Um, that would be really interesting as well. So as long as injecting fractalkine makes these patients feel better for any point of time or any degree of time or length of time, that would be incredibly important information. It would tell us what we need to target. It would tell us we really need to target on a way to durably reduce the activation of the microglia. So I would love to do that pilot study. I suspected that Fractalkine has never been injected in humans, although I know it's been injected in rodent models. Right before this talk, I looked really quick to see if anyone had ever done this in humans, and I saw that in the multiple sclerosis literature, they are really interested in fractalkine for the same reasons I'm interested. They're thinking the same thing about MS as I'm thinking about fibromyalgia and MECFS. So I was hoping that someone had already developed fractalkine for human use, and I saw a story it, it, it was uh, some news story that popped up. It said um, medical breakthrough, uh, fractal kind was administered to patients with MS and they got better. I got really excited. I was like, oh, someone's got fractal kind. They're, they're going to give it to me and I'll, I'll be able to test this myself. When I traced back who had actually done it, I, I got to the original work and found out the patients were actually rodents. So not as interesting as I originally had hoped. So as far as I know right now, fractalkine has still not been given to humans, but clearly there are groups working on it. So I will talk with those groups and my goal will be to try to get fractalkine for humans available as quickly as I can to test it. Now that requires a lot of steps, IRB and FDA and funding and such, but I will investigate it because if we could have something that we kind of know how fractokine works. If we could test it and it works in these patients, it's just a really good indication that we're on the right track. And then we can develop a drug that will kind of on a more chronic fashion or more long lasting fashion, uh, improve those conditions. So that's the basic story. Uh, I just wanted to share some of that, uh, some of those data and some of those results. 
and I will keep you updated. Just uh, keep track of the channel, and if I do get a hold of the fractal kind and get prepared to do an experiment, I will tell you about it. And of course, when we get results, I'll tell you about those as well. So it's just one of the many agents that I'm looking at that I think could really help these diseases that we desperately need treatments for them. And there are some good options. And this is one that I hope uh, will end up uh, helping patients. So thank you for listening and uh, keep tuned. And next week, I'll give you some more updates about the things we are working on in the lab. Thanks.